That's right. Keep it up. Keep doing nothing. Keep thinking about it. It's not going to help us. Thinking don't get us anywhere. How many uh, statements have I made coming into the broadcast in the last few weeks? Action, folks. you got to do something, not think about it. It takes a little bit to understand. Today we're going to go through a little bit more of that. But before we go on, public service announcement. Those of you that are, those of you crickets that uh, just take anything over the counter or anything you're offered without really checking into it, you need to know this one. Uh, those are vape. Marijuana vaping contains contaminants. I want you to all know about this. It's not just about vaping. It's about anything you take in your system. You don't really research down what these things do. Test proved marijuana vaping product contaminant is linked with a mysterious deadly lung illness. State and federal officials have found the same chemical in samples of marijuana-based vaping products used by people sickened in the different parts of the country who have used different vaping brands in the recent weeks. So I also understand there's probably a little bit of an attack going on, but you have to understand my focus on any of this is start paying attention. It doesn't matter what you're made, by whom, by who, certified or not. You have to look into what's going on. Now here, it's an interesting thing. The, the e-cigarettes, and then we have the contaminant, is actually something you would think a, you, you might use for health reasons is actually a, a killer, causes a problem. happens to be something derived from vitamin E that is put in these smoking, smoking uh, things, and come, you ingest it through your lungs, and it causes trouble. So, so-called health supplement would cause you trouble if you put it, use it the wrong way. So, I guess that's my warning to you all. No matter what you use, whether it comes from the government or comp a company trying to profit from you, you really have to pay attention. You really have to start looking around. Look and see what this stuff does. I, mean, I guess I get a little bit of, of this going on. I do, uh, when I did a lot more herbal remedy type things, you just don't say, oh, someone says that works for this. You run through a whole lot of, it takes a little bit of time to work out whether things may work for you or not. But certainly ingesting anything in your lungs is a serious, a serious consideration. That no, not many people look at that. I've never understood why people smoke and vape and all that stuff anyway. But because of the sensitivity of that, cell structure and its susceptibility to damage, just generally. But to any rate, so be, those of you that are crickets that are vaping, watch out. Vitamin E may not be too good if you ingest it. And I'm supposed, I suspect there's all kinds of stuff that's going on with that, whether or not the government wants you doing that, whether or not they want you on their stuff. But this is, again, medicine and pharmacology is the same way. You don't, we don't know what they, you don't want to read the data sheet to tell you that it'll kill you. What's, what's the point then? No one wants to listen behind a woodshed and say, well, we want to use that data sheet up front. Say, maybe I don't, I can't take this. Maybe it's you know, the, the risk against me is, is not as much as I need to take this material. That's all medicine is. It's a risk against a worse condition. As I've said before, I'm not against the properly diagnosed Western medicine. If, if it wasn't for Western antibiotics, I wouldn't be here today. I contracted something in my blood that would have killed me decades ago. And so without it, I wouldn't be here. So there's there's always a, a thing. You always use it in a proper way. Obviously, this is not the proper way. So Society of Crickets, we continue to think we're doing okay. We, we want a freedom. We want to do this and that. We think we relieve ourselves from what our responsibilities are to ourselves. And then we can see the effects of it generally through all societies now globally. And before I forget, like I did last week, this is BTW RLM. 335 for you on the past cast, broadcast, after cast, whatever cast you are. Hopefully not one on your arm or leg. And we'll uh, get you the content links. I understand now the SEO, the option for the search engines and stuff to bring bring us up to par uh, on, the, on the search engines is working. Grimner showed, showed me that if you use that code, we get right up on the, your listing is right on top. So there's no no excuse not to get the the diet, the at least the start of the content that I uh, give you, they call it the news, and I, I believe it's notice. They're telling us stuff we don't may not know the re reason why, but we can see through it to protect ourselves. And we never lose that responsibility. That, uh, we tend to, but we never have lost that responsibility to pay attention for ourselves. 
and so many people don't take the time. It's a, I don't know why. I don't know where that came from, but you know, the, I guess the instant gratification thing. Uh, and uh, more smoke in our eyes here, just breaking. And as I, you know, I don't really pay much attention to some of this. The calendar is kind of a foreign thing to me. It just time flies anymore. Uh, buzzing in my mind, the time flies. But uh, we now get the report coming out to let us know again the trauma-based uh, programming that goes on. I won't stick too much on it. Uh, Putin warned Bush about impending attack two days before 9-11. This is just breaking on. I didn't even read more than to see this report. Uh, when you uh, supposedly written uh, by a CIA, a former CIA analyst, right off the bat, what's former to a CIA is a problem. And then the point here really caught me was the first paragraph again, uh, the setup for the takedown. We can go ahead and we can chew on this all we want, but it leaves out everything else that we should be thinking about, about the 9-11 thing. Russian Vla President Vladimir Putin had called U.S. counterpart George W. Bush two days before the 9-11 attacks in 2001, warning about the imminent terrorist plot coming from Afghanistan, a former CIA analyst was has revealed. Now, what does that have to do with everything we found about the Saudis and the six uh, celebrating Israeli Zionists who apparently knew what was going to happen beforehand, which I've told you they knew about this back in 1987 in the FBI court case in the first attempt. So there's a whole lot of this stuff that's nonsense. I, I can't even go to even get involved in this. It comes out right at the proper time to trauma-based remind everybody and to get everybody off the point. And my view on this was, I told you before, when I saw the, finally got to see the video that morning of what was going down, my only reaction was they went and done it. Well, what they went and done? They went and done the plan that had that they had exposed back in 1987. They went and pulled the trigger, but that meant something. And I th that was when I realized they went and done it, and we were in for a big fall. They were going to use this war of of terror against us now. And there was no justification. I want everyone to remember at least this. The government of the United States, whomever pulled that off, failed the people of the United States. They were derelict in their duty to protect the United States, and now they're making you pay for it, which is part of the plan, but I'm going to hit a different. What if it wasn't a plan? The government of the United States was derelict to protect you, and now they're making you pay for that. And things I'm going to point out today. It's funny what came through the news. All of a sudden it kind of rolled up to remind us about the dire straits this country is was placed in with 9-11. That was caused by the United States government's dereliction in the minimum, even if I don't look at all the other nonsense. And so we're going to get, again, it came out just in time, a former CIA analyst, I doubt it, is telling you a story they want. It came from Afghanistan. That opens the door to a whole bunch of other nonsense that isn't being talked about. But Putin done it, I guess, and it wasn't enough. How's that? Now let's move on to really what starts to bring up uh, an attack. The ramifications of this 9-11, which I di really didn't, that it came up, that I had put these tabs up and then this story popped up today was kind of interesting to bring me into what I was going to say anyway, but now it rem reminds me of the cause. I don't rem I'm not really focused on the 9-11. Uh, I, I know it happened. I told you what I th my thoughts are over the years. And that meant something, and we didn't rise up to the occasion. We didn't rise up so much that by 19, uh, 2010, uh, 2010, and then I told you in 2012 when it finally broke loose and I felt that I felt comfortable in explaining to it, I went to crickets because our home nation, and actually the, the world, uh, bought into and would not stop this nonsense, which is going to bring essentially the prison planet that we hear. It's already happened, but you don't realize that. And so we, but inside that, I said, uh, then I brought up the idea of, well, this is always a war condition. They just made it more, uh, more hard, uh, they made it more apparent, and they went to the ultimate thing that the government had to do, given the priority, uh, the priorities and the precedences that have been foisted upon the people to called national security. And I predicted that in myself, and just on my reading, that they had to go there, because they have to put up something that you can't really beat in many places unless you can show, as I've been explaining this to, that that whole thing is a fraud. And now we have these little other types of cracks that have come out that I want to explain today. And uh, these are really used, that we're going to talk about at the federal level when I get there, uh, what they're going to talk about, the, what the federal level is doing, but we're also going to be able to address these very same things at the local level with the local uh, soldiers, cops. Because of the federal oversight of this whole place, and then you look at the context, you start listening for 
uh, whether or not something's law enforcement or just an investigation, whether something is judicial and law to, to put against you, right or wrong, whatever, or the administration of investigation, the administration, you will start to hear and see how you have to start thinking that I don't think people appreciate. And I'm going to continue to point this stuff out, especially for those of you that are on the front line trying to prove your rights. Like I have the right to carry a, a barren arm out in the public, or I have a right to free speech, or I have a right to do whatever in the streets and I'm being accosted by the cops. You, Those of you on the front lines have to start hearing the things I hope I will get to today in a coherent manner relative to judicial and investigatory or administrative things. And, if you, and I keep telling you, if you don't start talking through these that are recognized by the occupier, you will get nowhere and you will get beat down because of it. And well, your record, you're making a proper record and objecting properly to certain things is how this thing works through. You're going to find out when you can identify fundamental rights that they are protected, but even so, you're going to find out they're handled administratively. And the way they did that is they put a higher priority in the many. As I told you last week, that doesn't mean all. So if you become the exception, not only because of your opinion, but you become the exception because you have your black and white and your the obligations of this occupier to recognize in order, they have a, if not impossible time, a much more difficult time against you. And we're not talking about, I know so much and so I'm the power. I've got the force. They will kill you. You What you do is you understand what the condition is and you prepare your record as um, non-violently and, tele- non- and don't telegraph any potential violence that they can even make up, which steps you should be stepping back three or four steps to address these people who can literally pull a gun and shoot you at any time. We haven't seen that. So we're moving from the smoke, the, the smoke about the 9-11 and all that, and the smoke that happened to cover up all that was 9-11, uh, blowing more smoke in our face. Uh, now we're coming to the, we got to the chemistry that gets you to, Silent weapons, they get you to smoke the vapor. They get you to take the, the drugs. They get you to take the food that's all poisoned. Remember all that modernization and security stuff I talked to you about years ago. Years and years ago, I said, this is the plan now on you. This is them showing you every aspect of the life that they're going to control, and you have really nothing to say. When you, have, when you don't say anything, you have nothing to say. When you do say something, you're going to at least put an obstruction that hopefully others would see and then come to rally, which never happens. And I, uh, I mean, I say that never. I uh, hope to change my mind, folks. I mean, it's, look at what's going on. White House considers new projects seeking links between mental health and violent behavior. All comes out of what they did in 9-11. They put everybody into uh, the enemy combatant status, whether or not you're going to be outwardly deemed that or not. That's how you're treated. In other words, as I point out, your presumption of innocence was stolen. And no one went to stop that. And uh, they, uh, they think, uh, well, no one thinks at all, but uh, you would sense that national security is more important. Again, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. That's really not the way it works. I tell you, when you're, the, needs of the, few of the, the needs of the few are still, even in corporate law, are protected if you know and you look at that method. In fact, that might be a good guideline. If you went to corporate, corporations law, corporate law, and you looked at how the minority is protected. Now, it's not absolute, but at least gives you a measure of, of some say. And you look at that method, it'll, it'll, it's a similarity that you can apply in a, in a more definite space than what I might be able to convey here behind the woodshed. Uh, again, lots of stuff that comes in my mind. I think about how this applies, and my mind just attaches all the things, makes it all conform to our I've made a consistency no matter what type of law you're looking at or what type of unlawfulness you're looking at, what's coming against you relative to the possibilities and probabilities of what you're up against, and then I make pathway through that for myself. I'm trying to explain some of this to you so you can start doing that for yourself, those of you that put yourself on the front line. It's not, this is serious, really serious stuff. They're willing to take down a bunch of people in, uh, uh, in New York and they're willing to blame it on some guy in a cave, and we're not going to look at the uh, the elephant in the room uh, and the continuing uh, problems. I don't know about y'all as far as a society. And just complaining about it or laughing it off as a joke, that's a serious joke nonetheless, but not doing much to do anything at all is certainly not going to stop this nonsense. So I told you before the mental holds, they used to pull mental holds on people uh, in the courts way back in the 90s when you started to bring up certain things. So White House considers new project links mental health 
with violent behavior. This is, uh, again, um, it's like you're going to be looking for the AI will be manipulating the data to essentially feel the knobs on your head to determine what kind of a uh, violent criminal you are. And they're going to deem every, if you watch the psychiatric definitions increase, there's nothing they don't define. If they define it, they could, they own it. And you're going to have to stay ahead of this or you're going to be subject. And you will be taken down because you're not listening to what I say ahead of time and you're not taking, you're not actively participating in your own protection. You can't leave it to someone else. They'll, they'll, they'll make a product for you to, to take on. Uh, you'll accept it. And it's just to me, it's all now the silent weapons for quiet wars. It looks like these weapons are everywhere. And I told you, you're going to plug in. You're going to pick them up because they're so handy. I mean, they are, some of these things are useful, but when they're put in your hands that they're used against you because it's so, so, so cool, they're actually uh, insights for, to you. In fact, we have a story coming up about that. If I get, you know, I've got to get to this uh, through a little quicker. The White House has been briefed on a proposal to develop a way to identify early signs of changes in people with mental illness that could lead to violent behavior. End right there. It's not going to be on any determinate you are. The experts will say here. These experts that are killing us in every other place are going to kill you here. They're going to go after your mental health. And when someone of authority says you have a mental deficiency, the monkey's on your back literally, and you're going to have to be dealing with that. Uh, it's going to propel this whole thing forward even further. Uh, and being a violent, a violent, perceived to be violent, you're a pariah in the society. And all this social triggering that you see is actually part of that uh, preparation for people. Right? So we've got a serious, uh, they're getting, really, I've said this before, but the, this, these tabs this week are showing how far ahead they're moving and how quickly. And I don't really hear a bunch of anything. This is certainly now tied to gun control and other things. But it's going to be everything. But once they get, again, this is all that social credit stuff we've been hearing coming out of China that's in the United States already. Uh, and so we'll move on here. Uh, as these, these ideas proposed federal agency would create criteria to identify potentially violent people. This is a kind of follow-up story on the same thing that identifies red flags. This story here, they're, they're referencing the, the, the Washington Post uh, starting out with something. You, all y'all, uh, conspiracy theorists and uh, weather modification and all with HARP. Here, here's one that's going to stick one in your eye. According to the Washington Post, the proposal is a part of a larger initiative known as the Health Advanced Research Projects Agency, or HARPA, kind of like DARPA with an H, kind of like HARP, mind control, weather control from the north. All right, so this is these guys play games with this. They're triggering all this stuff. He's, I think it's funny at some level, but, but no one's going to do anything about it. After you hear about what this is, or you just say it's oh, it's a dystopian nightmare. We're doomed. That's it. In fact, they're telling you what's coming down. They're using private companies. You're going to hear a consistency with how your world is being changed this week, and who is doing this, and what you all will continue to buy into or reject, and then maintain silence. The crickets, which will continue and allow these things to go on. The Harpa would be uh, work with private companies, other federal agencies, and academia to cooperate and promote health-related research. Well, it's just health of the government, not you. But understand here the private partnerships, that's just fascism, first of all. Secondly, listen to whom is being integrated with this. Federal agencies, academia, and private companies. You're going to hear this again in a different context. In a court case that just came out, that explains that all these like no-fly lists and these uh, terrorist watch lists, they are disseminated to all these same places. Now, why would it go to academia was what caught my eye. Well, because that's your alternative dispute resolution problem. That's what the university system is, how the university system is, be, is the tool of controlling you locally through the policies made through consensus. Well, climate change, that's a, that's a global one. They use that same process locally. What I was telling you on that uh, for, climate forcing Stop looking at this as a non-political point. It's only a political design. It has political ends. It has political mechanisms. There is no science. There's no science to any of it. This is an agenda. And we keep focusing on the wrong thing. You want to start thinking harp is changing your weather and mind. Well, look, they're going to stick another one in your face. Now they're going to now they're going to put the what you feared was affecting your mind against you again when they they determine that it has. Because you're not getting ahead of the game here. And all I can do is so much so I can tell you, and those that are interested, what I hope would rechange their focus on the more proper things to do. There's things that we could be doing here. 
And uh, again, we, it, you all deny it. You all want to take these little safe spaces that you create in your mind. Oh, I put myself in a place I don't have to care. Oh, it's all right. I'm not going to go any further. Oh, I don't have to. Ingrate. I'm doing what I can do. That's all I can do. No, there's a whole lot of other things that we were required to do. I'm not saying that for, I'm not making that definition. I certainly now see it after all these decades, though. So the couple of these with the red flags, they're anticipating a records that are being made behind your back, which you're going to have to understand how to assert fundamental things in the nature of the rights they will recognize and find the court cases that state that that have not been overturned. This is how you're going to start analyzing these court cases, not because the court cases mean anything to you because your case is different, but the principles, again, behind which we talked about the principles applied, and that determines can determine your future if it changes you. If it don't, you're just going to be this wanton rogue, and no one's going to like you. You might think you're the greatest thing since light white bread, but no one else will. And then we have the society thing that's not going to enmesh so well with you. And so, we have things to do. You know, HARPA. You know, they're going to harp on you, all right. Like DARPA, but only for your mental health. And foreigners will determine that. They will make records against you. What have I been saying about how you, do, how you do that? It's all done administratively. Understand this. It's all investigative. This gives them some measure of protection. I've offered you reasons on or points on how you defeat that to stop this buffer that they build in, like, it's, it's easier to see in the traffic stops. The cop commands the discussion. And I've told you, you can't allow that. You can't fight with them, but you can't allow them to, de to define the direction. And you have to have a better word in your mouth to show what they're doing is really more of a crime. Under collar, to do an interference of a fundamental thing. And the court case I'm going to get to here uh, is going to show you that there's a current now decision that identifies this so-called right to travel. Now, it doesn't do it directly like saying you have a right to travel. It finds that there's a right to travel that's a fundamental protection, that the government administratively is constrained to do certain things. So if you, speak, if you think in these ways, if you understand what they're saying and you start presenting your position through that, you'll be able to address, any, whether this is a federal issue or state or quasi-federal state, partnership, whatever, you'll be able to understand how to use what you know are your rights but are being ignored to put the constraint on a constraint, not an elimination. Understand that. This is a constraint because you're an occupied people, right? So you don't get free. The fundamental, you'll find in the court case here I'm going to talk about, fundamental, it isn't free. It means that you could still get to go up against a pressing need. We heard that last week, the, the rights of the many and the vaccines. And I said, well, why don't you be the special case? And then we point, and then I pointed out that even the government itself says that the few people that would be the few could not affect the many. And so you you eliminate you, you eliminate the, the cause of the government under its so-called police power. And this is what we're going to speak. This is what we're talking about. 9-11 invoked the police power in such a way, in such an ominous way, that I don't know if many people understand it enough to even begin to approach it. And I only can, I believe I do but I haven't put it in the context except for going through the mining law, which I can put, put the national security of the nation through mining against the national security concerns of the country itself. And that is what you do. Your rights relative to your fundamental rights relative to this is not so protectable, but it is recognized to be protected, and that then sets a different stage. And if you don't set that table, if you will, you won't be eating from the banquet of the rights you think you have. They become just this decision that's made by the occupier or their agents, like the Bar Association. So here we have, they're coming after your, men, your mental health. The federal government is going to work to create behavioral uh, guidelines. Remember, this is a, this a, a twenty thirty or Agenda 21 or the global order is about your behavior and controlling that. Again, that's what carbon taxes. They, they raise the price of energy so high you can't afford it. You're not going to use that. That's behavioral control. But be careful on what you think is being controlled when they go after your rights. So this is an excuse. And so you have to be able to explain it, not just say, oh, that's an excuse. You have to be able to delineate, well, more, it's a crime. It's not just an excuse. It's a crime. And how? Remember, let's go back to the, quickly the carbon tax. You heretic, criminally insane people do not believe in this. 
That's punitive coming out of the gate. That's how you identify it quickly as a violation under the laws of nations with laws, where people's property and rights is sacrosanct or ought to be, whether or not you enjoy that or not. Okay, so they're using the, the pressure. I just see this week the pressure is coming on. The, they're starting to tell you. They're starting to tell you how they're coming at you. They're taking away everything you're going to be. I don't know if anybody of you, my listeners, have been know anybody, if not you, but know anybody who's been underneath a mental hold. It's not a neat thing at all. It's very difficult. And you, so far, we hadn't. We had. I haven't seen in my in my experience with. I have never been put before one of those. Oh, they did question it once, but I I killed it immediately. And that's partly why you have to do this. Uh, friends of mine have gone in and put in mental hold, which means they're in jail for a while, a couple of days, while the psychiatrist shows up. And we haven't found yet that the psychiatrist is that criminal yet. That doesn't mean that won't change. You still are put in a hold. Your so-called liberty, which is really what it is, your con- your defined free. Is what liberty is, like a sailor coming off a ship. You're not free of that ship, and you're not free of not listening to the commander, the admiral, whoever's on the crew, the captain, whoever's on that boat. You're not free of that. You're in freedom. You're a domain of free, within a constraint. That's liberty. So uh, that's what we're in. We're not in being free. Now, there's this other view. You can actually present the free, but you have to understand how to start to do that and to show that the imposition, again, it's not law. You're going to watch this court case when I tell you, talk to you about it. They're talking administrative. I told you this is how it comes. When you want to deal with the TSA, you have to go administrative. When you want to deal with much of any of these things, go administrative. Unless you find a fundamental obligation on the United States government or the state government, like I've told you in the mining law, when that's an obligation. And then you can go find the laws that said they weren't supposed to trespass. Now we've got the felony up front. There is no administration. In fact, in that side, as I've explained, patent law, Re- statutes relative to patent law will say the, ju- juris- the judiciary branch, judicial branch, the judiciary has no authority to alter or modify those things. In other words, there is no subject matter jurisdiction that they can take to take a case, and no person to, uh, no personum jurisdiction to attach, because the government's obligated to uh, not touch these things. And so if you have this in your mind, that's the truly fundamental part. You strip even the courts. I'm not saying this is easy, and I'm not saying you do it on my word. I'm saying it takes a little bit of work to set up the record, and you'll hear as I get here to how that starts to do, what you're given as given guidance of what the occupier does, but you better do it before they put a mental hold on you because you just be a nut. And this is how they start taking the society down. They start deeming, just deem you punitively, without due process, without any hearing, without anything, uh, with the color of the authority of an expert, say, that you are something to be vilified. And you have to understand this, because that's how you get at these conditions. I keep talking about this week after week. Now here, so here's what happens on a, a corporate level. It just happened now. We're talking red flag laws. That can be talking about guns. It's going to be talking about anything eventually that uh, those in the powers that have decided that you are some scourge against Gaia will tell you, will, will say you, you don't have the rights to do much of anything. If it, if it harms the many, which is just the atmosphere, the environment itself. Uh, it, it becomes, uh, you're not even part of it, you're an enemy to it. Uh, so, But San Francisco comes out, and this time we're talking guns, because that's what the red flag laws seem to be focusing on, because that's what the political agenda is right now, but it's, it's more than that. I just want to remind you, always more. It's just they get you focused on one thing, and you don't realize it's attacking the rest. San Francisco officials designate NRA a domestic terrorist organization. Now, I may feel that they are because they actually don't protect gun rights. They actually get in bed with the government to compromise. So, um, that's, but that's just the, just my thought about that. But as a terror, domestic terrorist organization, to be determined that without a hearing, San Francisco really, the supervisor in San Francisco really went out on a limb to pull this out, and they did is the problem. They went ahead and said it. And there is no, there's no authority for any of this. There's, no determination that they could have actually lawfully made, but they do it anyway. Now they now they put the scar and the taint on you. And you're going to hear that I've been telling you about the only thing we have left is due process. I'm, get to, I'm trying to get down to this court case uh, to explain this. Uh, the San Francisco has said that the NRA, uh, the NRA, which is a national rifle association, is a domestic terrorist organization, and they have their unreasonable reasons, but they make the statement anyway. So they're not bashful to make really stupid statements 
and now they taint your character. What I talked to you about, about defaming your good your good name or the rights, the name you have that was right to have, the actions that you've taken in in the past, and all this thing. They they diminish those just by a word. Oh, so this is a I guess we could say this is a what a defamation case. Well, but more more importantly, they're they're coming after the point that was started by 9-11 relative to domestic terrorism and naming organizations within the United States these domestic terrorists. And if your membership with that is is there, then you get then the scrutiny comes on you from where and where does the information go? The FBI, academia, the news outlets, the governments, the police, everywhere. There's no piece of information that now doesn't get disseminated. They're telling you this in this week's news and in this court case I'll be getting here too. So they vilify us, everybody, whether you, whether you like the NRA or not. I don't, you know, to me it's just another organization. It's a, a lobbying group that diminishes yourself. It's like a, a union, uh, any union. If you've ever been involved in a union, they do sweetheart deals. That's compromise. It may not live up to the law. But everyone now starts living by it, and then you forget the you forget what the law. So when the guy law, when someone wants to come and bring the law, you look like a nut. Oh, there we go. Now we're going to be a mental hold. So we have Harpa and DARPA. The federal government's pulling this together. Do you understand this is military? Did you pick? Did you did that thought occur to you? It's military imposition continuously, as I've been saying over and over and over. Don't miss this. All the subject matter that's talked about has a military organization coming to make the determination for your life, for your future, for your the information you're going to have, the cutting out, the censorship of it. DARPA unleashes anti-meme militia to fight deep fake and polarizing viral content. This is military coming in. They want to talk about interfering, uh, interfering with elections and this and that and the memes that might do so. And the military is coming to make the control. Should be your focus on this. Not all the reasons why it's not right is that the military is doing it and they have no right at all unless you live in an occupied territory. All c created by what they pulled the trigger in 9-11. Which is coming what? In a couple days as we are going to get that shock treatment again to verify that this is a real thing and not a plan against us, and we're not going to move properly. We'll just argue again. So I'll be looking at, oh, the the building didn't come down by, by fire. I got the I got the model. Well, we, listen, don't rely on models. I mean, okay, it didn't, but, I mean, don't rely on the model. Forget that. What did the government, how was the government upholding its duty to protect anybody when it failed to do stop that and then turned around and blamed everybody else? And you let that happen. And now they're coming at you because now they can blame away. They can blame they can blame you for causing it. And the whole target was to come after anybody that was against the government in any way to interfere with its or military control of this place. The civil war didn't go away. I don't know why people that's so hard to figure out. So uh, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, probably aided DARPA, aided by HARPA now is seeking software capable of churning through a test set of a half a million news stories, photos, and audio video clips to target and neutralize, neutralize, don't, does, don't they do that to terrorists? Neutralize them, uh, potentially viral information before it spreads. Uh, let's see. You can read the story. The point is that they're taking strides in order to uh, control your uh, speech. More importantly, they're going to control the narrative uh, relative to whatever that could be elections or any other thing, whether that's your health, uh, whether that's uh, countering the decisions made by authorita relative to what they need to have done. Uh, I do want to say something. I, I find it very fascinating. One of my browsers will not load uh, Russian today, and yet when I go through a proxy, it'll load. So I find this very interesting. It doesn't do it on other browsers. So I haven't figured this one out, but uh, again, I started to realize, well, this is another way to prove, maybe this is the story they're proving, but you may not see the story. You click on it, it doesn't go anywhere. And so here, DARPA military is doing this. And they will bring the necessity of keeping elections solid. When The point to me is, that proves they're not. And when you look into the, if they're just doing the surface communication using the t hardware, they're failing to look at the underlying vulnerabilities of all that hardware or people that can hack into it all. 
And so this is another mistaken step which identifies to us they don't intend to do what they say. But they're going to be working with what? You know, private corporations to do so. And here we have the same the story in the same week. Google, Twitter, and Facebook met government officials to devise election measures. Now, where is it in the Constitution that says that the federal government can do work with private partners, which is all consensus methodologies? If you don't believe in the outcome, you're going to be cut out. Right? Where do they have the right to go to the social networks to create the standards by which an election would not be tempered and how can we trust the government officials in the organization that's been created to do so the cyber security and infrastructure security agency how do we know they're not political and we, we can't know that see folks this is, this is how they do this how do we know this is not treason sedition right in our face when they're telling you that they're getting together with the main social media, and we know they're all integrated, they're all in bed, they're all getting contracts, all the suppliers are all working, the private parties are here doing the work in closed meetings, agencies that are supposedly lawfully set up in the government underneath ostensibly important things like election control, folks, remember, you do not elect the president and the vice president of the United States of America, you people. You don't do that. If they were going to protect the elect electoral college, they wouldn't worry about Google unless they're trying to do a PSYOP against you. They would go protect whomever and make it more secret or more protected who the electoral college members are. Because that's who, vet, who votes for the president and the vice president, if that's what the federal government's interested in. Shows me that this is a, a big operation going on. They know exactly what they're doing. It is just to keep you appeased that if you believe vote harder works, that's fine. I don't care about whether you think or not. You need to listen to this to know why are they going to this measures when it's actually the the members of the Electoral College are the only that elect the president and the vice president, or the elect the president. What are we thinking about here? Why don't we think this is a real harm? Why do we put more, com what's most important, trust and confidence in this confidence system? Th this is... Again, I think it's misplaced looking. We we talk politically. We don't attack the politics. We don't attack it as a weapon. We want to take sides to it. Or don't take a side at all and say, oh, look at how big I am because I don't agree with either. And yet the same the system is coming on you in different ways. And pretty soon you're all going to be deemed to be too nuts to have a say. And you'll be put in your little bitty squares and whatever. Your life will be constrained. You'll be put on monitors. You, you don't think that they're going to force the monitors can be just the social credits as well? And they do it preemptively. You're going to hear that in this court case when I get to it here. I'm trying to get to it quickly. And then, uh, so we're here at Google and Twitter and Facebook met with government officials. Who are these corporations, folks? That they have a front seat that you don't. So you mean nothing also. But why are they after you? Because they got to keep your confidence. Because they, they're they not going to affect, actually, the Electoral College, those people that are placed and selected by the states to be there, to make the vote. And so, remember these things. But here's the vulnerability. Even if they had the right Google, Twitter, and Facebook, even if, I love the even if argument, and even if you did it, even if you had all the right, you still failed, you're still wrong, you're still criminal, is how I like to run it. And you don't do it by your opinion, you do you lay it out the facts and the elements to show even if the government asserted its point, it would be wrong. Or anybody, any authority, any expert, uh, maybe not enough. Remember, there's other things. Maybe they only focus on a narrow narrow aspect. Remember, the property doesn't mean the right to the property. Uh, in fact, that's ex the, right, the property interference is extortion, and when you affect the right of a property, that's, a, that's coercion. Two different uh, felonies. Super micro. So here's the Google and Twitter and all this. and the They want to focus on the social media network. It's just a software program that runs on a hardware. Uh, super micro. You know, now we know. Did they, did they go address this problem? No, of course not. Super micro bug could let virtual USBs, virtual USBs, non-existent USBs created in software to take over corporate servers. All y'all that uh, want to believe the United States is a corporation, and you can go to Title 28, Section 3002 to prove it, you think that they have corporate servers in the United States of America? Do you think that the super micro bug that can make virtual USBs to allow interjection of software hacking anywhere they want and to take exfiltrate and infiltrate information, do you think that your elections can be secured? 
But anyway, so this article right here just disproves what they're doing can do anything, and it's all for your consumption. So, so literally, vote harder because that's you can just push that mouse button, you can punch those little holes, scribble that pencil, go whatever, do what you want to do on the on the federal level, even I think at the state level. So I've seen the evidence of the old machines. I know they did it. I've seen all the evidence of the electoral hacking that's done in software. It, that should never be a question anymore. We should have done the same thing with the with now what they to try to tell you they can protect against uh, with elections. We should have done it 9/11. See, we don't. We don't say, wait a minute, you were derelict to protect us. Don't now attack us. And now we have to have a, your regime has to be changed out. You should just all, you need to resign. And if you don't, we're going to work hard to make you resign. If that's what we're going to do, if that's what we only thing we have to do, then we're going to do that. We didn't do any of that. When we found out the election, uh, the election could be hacked or whatever, they even concerned about it. Russian did it. Putin did it. D, but we found out actually the Democrats do it. Republicans are doing it too. Don't worry about it. Then you didn't rise up to say, but you're derelict to maintain the, the confidence. And so we out you go. We don't do that. No, we talk about all this other nonsense. We keep, oh, did the, can the towers go down with a flame? Oh, it was nukes. Who cares now, folks? Look what they're doing since then. As I said, you're 20 years behind the times. Get up, get up with it. Super microbug can be interjected on a thumb drive. This is how they had, the Stuxnet was done, but they needed somebody. They needed somebody to go put the drive in the Iranian uh, software in this Iranian uh, centrifuges to blow them up through Stuxnet and other places. Now they don't need it. I think this is just news to us. They never needed it. To put it that way. And so your whole system, all your life, your digital life, your virtual life is sitting on this problem, these problems. And and you don't see that the Pentagon or you don't see the election officials underneath these cybersecurity protection. They don't see them looking at the problem. No, they look at they look at the social software that runs over the top of it. Can't be that they're interested in what to solve anything. Or more what I look at, it's not important. They just get you to think it's important. So this all starts starts to be. They treat you, what, you're a mental midget, you're mentally harmful, you're violence, you've already been an enemy combatant, so you have no protection against that. They called you that, but you didn't have any due process. No one said anything about this stuff. I've been trying to tell you to do this kind of thing. That's the important thing. Start addressing administratively. There's not much going to be much more they're going to already do to you. They're already calling you these nasty things and treating you that way. You might as well just get in and start doing something about it. The feds use a reverse warrant to try to track down bank robbers in Wisconsin. We think, well, that's good. Reverse warrants are a new tech related to law enforcement. Oddly, a lot of uh, what's uh, come to light so far originates in the Midwest, an area not exactly known to early adoption. Outside the New York uh, Police Department and feds confirming they use warrants to seek at least a possible suspect rather than targeting any specific suspect, most reporting uh, has covered deployments of law enforcement agencies in Minnesota. We can add Wisconsin to the list of areas. Uh, these reverse ones, we've talked about them before behind the woodshed. They're really problematic. Again, we talk about uh, general targeting, not specific targeting. This becomes the problem. This becomes what the 9-11 actually pulls out. We, need, we were able to remove the presumption of innocence and make everybody a potential suspect. Potential. E even by an implication. And so if we can use reverse warrants to suck people up, into this infrastructure they're building, and you're part of that digital dynamic, you're not having much protection against all the rules and the things that are going on between private corporations and election officials, or the government making its experts' perf uh, evidence or statements uh, uh, able to take you down by a mere statement that you have a mental problem. That you have a behavioral problem. You're a behavioral threat to the many in the board who won't step up and stop this nonsense, who will not go after the judges that allow for generalized reverse warrants. That you're going to find out now, and I'm getting here, uh, the court case coming close is a problem where they have, where an investigation can be now deemed to be subject to constraint. 
Now, if you see the judiciary allowing these things, the administration certainly taking great license. That, okay, so, so then we have this condition in the war against you. We have the ability to infiltrate or exfiltrate information within the systems. We have a governmental agencies that uh, prop up whatever they want to keep your confidence, whether that's 911, how it happened, how, whatever you think didn't happen, the elections, that they make any matter uh, at the federal level, that you think you're a voter and so you elect a president, forgot to read your constitution, that don't happen, and then, then you argue, well, if I don't have a vote, then maybe electoral college is no good when you don't research the electoral college is one of the stop gaps for for this such of uh, for a, a, a complete route, which is actually stop direct democracy, which is what they've done to your senators, and again on and on, and destroyed your your local voice, uh, and destroyed the ability uh, to have protection even to local level. Like I don't remember the count. There was a court case that came out that said your sen- it was actually the ramifications of the court case caused the senators to be elected by the people and not the state representatives. And that inadvertently, inside the states, took out the local control of the counties, like the states would have at the Senate. And so now we have, we're now susceptible. The pendulum swung completely the other, what they were, the ill that the Supreme Court was trying to fix because they got politically involved instead of judicially involved, swings the pendulum to today. And I'm having to talk to you about consensus process destroying our, our nation, our productivity, and all this other stuff. It swung over there. Because local jurisdictions, like your counties, that were duty bound and attempt them up to protect you, cannot. And, and this rolls down to the same thing about the electoral college. There's a group of people that vote for these people, but then you have to look and see what are you sitting in. And no, nobody wants to really look at that. They just complain. They just they don't come up with a better idea. No, they make the decisions that get us here, and we're having to talk about how bad it is. So the feds are doing reverse. Well, the feds are doing a whole lot to take advantage. They're doing it. Because of 9-11, that the story that pops up, I didn't even know, I mean, re- literally, I didn't realize it was 9-11 until I saw the story about, oh, Putin did it, went to Bush. And, and you look at the story, wait a minute, that looks like a setup, because it doesn't talk about a whole lot of other things. How did other people know? Uh, if it was just uh, Afghanistan and the cave people, how did other people know? There had been a great, a great uh, meeting one day that they all c- kind of knew what was going to happen, and uh, at least six Israeli uh, Zionists were standing on the bridge looking and, and celebrating, so that should have been a problem. But at any rate, uh, this was all known before, like I said, 1987, long before. Uh, but here we get to the point now. The, I told you, silent weapons are quiet wars. Feds order Apple and Google to hand over names of 10,000 users of gun scope apps. Now, I'm not on the gun thing. That's a, a writing thing on through today, too. The red flag laws and his gun ownership and all this is an attack on you. But the courts have allowed feds to go to Google and Apple. And all of you that uh, thought it was cool to have a gun scope app, they now have your, uh, however, they now have your account name and they now can track you down for whatever. Well, if that comes behind the scenes on this HARPA and that's deemed to be a violent behavior, you're now on a list that you don't know about. The scariest thing you'll read all day, report sounds alarm over brain reading technology and the neurocapitalism, neurocapitalism. A Vox report that swiftly sparked alarm across the Internet Friday outlined how, quote, the, in the era of neurocapitalism, your brain needs new rights. I've told you, folks, you're going to have to start writing rules and laws against the infiltration and uh, subjugation of all everything you thought you were about and you're free, being free and all that. You're going to have to write a law to protect it. Here's another one. Because of the uh, technology, the technocrats, they're coming to read your brain. We talked about this stuff on it's, uh, before, long, you know, months and months ago, if not years ago, about the technology coming to do this. Remember, the rat, I told you, that experiment. They said that the human caused the rat's tail to move. I said, no, that was the rat telling the human to move my tail because I didn't want to be embarrassed by me flopping around like some twitching piece of meat. No, I'm going to put some dignity. And the rat said, no, uh, human, you will tell me to move my tail. And that's what happened. Okay, so they got the interface. All right, They already got it worked out. Now, the scariest thing you're going to do is that they can use this against you. Do you think that's coming in to a Google or a Facebook or a, a device so you walk through the store near you tied into this massive 5G uh, Internet of Things network to create your credit, your mental hold, your, your profile, your credit profile? You think that's a right around the corner here while we hear that Google and Twitter and Facebook were talked with by election officials and didn't ask you? They don't care? You, you you are just something to be exploited, and you're exploitable. 
and you continue to allow it. Uh, yes, this is the scariest thing in a way. They start reading your thoughts. What if the algorithms are out and they don't re wrong and they don't read your thoughts correctly? And then you become on a, a, some kind of a watch list, folks. Right? This is what you, this is behavioral controls advanced against you before you even get moving, before you even have a chance. And then they keep it under the national security information they get to keep secret from you because it might affect their investigation to find terrorists. A completely made up, fabricated entity, like climate change, like any of the other stuff, like food shortages, like whatever, except of the real things, like, oh, there's fluoride in your water, oh, what about the data sheet and the vaccines that says it's going to hurt you? What about the fact you said 95% effective vaccines, why are you worried about the last point zero one percent what about that? Where are those contrails, persistent contrails here? What do they do? No, we don't look at all that stuff. We don't. We talk about it, but we don't start affecting. Remember, we talked about in Title 50, there's notice requirements. You have a right to go look for those notices, and then you get to make an objection. Does anybody make an objection? Just, I don't want it. No, you make the objection because they haven't done what? As I told you, you go through the administrative procedure and say, you gave us the notice, but you didn't tell us how you comported with the law in order to make the notice lawful relative to my rights and then find all the for fundamental rights they're violating. And then I add always the appurtenant ones, the ones that add on. And so this leads us up all this to this court case I've been talking about. They're building up this week and when we get a court case about every one of you is, could be involved in it and I think this is happening uh, anybody who travels the TSA, any of this is being subjected in the first order, second order of vilification, identification of uh, defamation of an enemy combatant or potentially so, and they talk about the suspected terrorists, this is the most serious one, and they don't have to have a guideline for that, except they have to have a process, and once they meet and reach and cross certain thresholds, it moves what may be discretionary in the agency as an investigation or investigative into a judicial requirement and constraint that must be delineated ahead of time. And what the unfortunate thing about this next story is not, I'm not going to get focused on it, but it focuses on the wrong thing, and the people who go down this trail will be vilifying the wrong point and not understanding how to use it. And that's what all these, new, these stories, these notices are, I think. We could get captured up in them. Uh, we could get focused in on the political side of this, and we could uh, try to vilify those that we hate or make up those that we hate or not hate at all and don't care. But whether or not uh, the ultimate reaction, the non-reaction is what they're after. However that comes, that this story is kind of troubling to me, but it points, it was the one of the first uh, notices of something happening. Democrat Republican Ilhan Omar celebrates after judge rules terrorist watch list violates constitutional rights. This story goes to vilify Omar. All these politicians are, are, are criminals. They, they should all be vilified. So, But it's not about someone wanting uh, rules and uh, the terror watch list violates constitutional rights. It actually didn't do that either. And this is the other problem. You've got to look very carefully. I told you that we were looking at court cases because we can look at them and see whether or not the news is a news cycle is a is a, a misdirection or whether it's accurate. This is a, also a misdirection. Not only is it politically motivated against Omar, which is a congressional Congress creator criminal, uh, anyway, that she says that she says the terror watch list violates constitutional rights. This woman writing about this, not that she's a woman, this writer uh, writing about this against must imply that the wa watch list is okay. Now, from my perspective, I don't care about Omar. I don't care about this author. The watch list is not okay. The no-fly list is not okay. And so we have a, well, at least first mentioned to me was, well, they're gonna, there's a court case out there. What is this? I uh, hadn't heard about it. We'll track it down. Pretty cool. But why are they focusing on what Omar thinks? Why are they against the watch list being declared unconstitutional? Even if that was correct. It's not. Again, I told you before, your constitutional rights are administratively proscribed if you don't say anything about it. In other words, you have to go through the administrative procedure first and until you can identify a fundamental protectable interest pulls you out of even the ripeness condition where, in other words, you, what they say, you have to exhaust your administrative remedies and you're going to find out in this case coming that we found unless that touches on a fundamental right. And so if you didn't know that and you go and say, my rights have been violated, they'll say, but you have to do right. You, you had to go through the administrative procedures because you didn't speak quite right. 
You didn't know how to assert your rights. And, and, and ignorance is no excuse. So, again, as I see these things, they're more instructive than they are uh, something we take to the bank and we use. But this story was troubling to me because it, mis, it misdirects everyone. It misdirects uh, this Omar, this misdirects, is misdirection, that it's constitutionally de declared unlawful. The screening database is, is, is misdirection. It's wrong. And then we get to uh, another website. Summary, government's management of terrorist screening database violates citizens' constitutional right court rule. That isn't actually the truth. When you go, and this is the, probably the most concise discussion in this link, and you'll find this when you come to the uh, blogcaster, of how to read the case through in the general sense, what it was going through. He talks about the issue, this and that. But all the headlines are reading that this violates, the, the database violates constitutional rights, when in fact the method that they have, the procedures are violating the rights. They actually agree that they need these these lists and databases. And so you get lost in what we're seeing without going and reading the case yourself and look very carefully. Uh, you're going to miss what's going on, and you're not going to respond, and you're going to you know, put away in your mind, oh, good, the watch list is unconstitutional. You won't. It's not, folks. It's, been not, it's not unconstitutional. They can still do it. What happened was they caused fundamental violations of fundamental rights, the procedures of which were insufficient to put someone on the list. It's a totally different thing about addressing. And so where I found this summary of... Uh, um, if you wanted to read in a quick form what the case kind of goes through, this was good enough to get you through that. But again, it doesn't, it does not uh, suffice for a new reading. This is a 32-page uh, discussion, and so I, um, I hesitate to read this stuff, but it's very important as I was reading through this. I hope I can do this pretty quickly. I want to read through some of this. I want to set it up for you, and I want, and I here's the point. It's not about a watch list that you're whatever, a Muslim, Arab, whatever. This has to do, you'll hear there's 4,600 Americans on this list in a law that says no Americans can be on, it's not, Americans are not supposed to even be considered. And that they speak in context of these fundamental rights, and you're, those of you that want to right to travel, it's in here, folks. Fascinating, it's in here. And then you read that it's subject. It's protectable, but subject means you're not enjoying it up front. When you see that, you have to start rethinking what you think about what, what, what you're doing, where you're at, and how you address it. The most important thing I found reading this is they kind of bounce between judicial and, and investigative or administrative. And in that, they give us the guidelines on how we should approach this. And I'm going to suggest, if you go through and you need to read, you really need to read this, you may need to read it 10 times. I don't know. I read cases relatively well, the first time, and there's sometimes I have to read a couple times, but but you read them, and you, you those of you that read this, that are in the streets, that are trying to do something, that are working against, that administrations are working against you, look at the constraint on the investigative part, and I will say, when you understand what this case is saying, you can apply the very guidelines the court uses against any cop in the street, when they tell you that it's not, they have no probable cause. You just understand it's investigative. Move to the administrative side in your discussion. And you apply, that when you read this, the, the judge makes the question for you in this case. If, if they find out they have no probable cause, you know now they're investigative. They're administrative. Now you put the next fundamental right on them that you then could res actually recite this and say, well, that court said, in this case, relative to travel, that you have this constraint on you. How are you fulfilling that? Well, what am I doing? I'm shifting this whole dialogue to, well, they're on me, to them, and now they have an administrative due process violation, even though you're facing jail. Think about how this is. Who thinks about this stuff, actually? But this is how it works. Those of you in the streets can take this case and apply something that about a no-watch list. If you look at what the administrative constraints are and restraints, relative to establishing a fundamental right. In other words, I have the right to move about. I have the right to do what I'm doing. And you came with a suspicion without probable cause, and now you continue to ask me questions. Where are you giving me notice of your right to do that? And what procedure have you established pursuant to this case that I have a right to respond, that I have a way to avoid? And more importantly, I don't have to participate. 
Where have you administratively in your investigative provis- provided for that is a whole lot more than trying to argue with the damn cop. I mean, anybody. You, you have to take this thing into the next level. And I don't say just because you make up the level. You look at these court cases. None of them actually apply to you. But the principles, the principles apply. At least you have a better word in your mouth relative to than just saying, am I free to go? No, you just move. I said you have to be fluid. I read this discussion. I read this uh, case. Uh, and that's my mind just goes into, well, look at all the stuff here in this case. If you pay attention to the details that people have available to them, in, like I've said in Alaska, with the Nick case and the case before that I'd, I've read, how to deal with these people even if you're underneath this occupation. And this case uh, agrees that the, uh, the watch lists against Americans is okay, even though the law doesn't apply. So there's still more work to do. Don't take this to the bank and it's the answer. No, this is the start of how you start to get a better thought in your brain, how to deal with this oppression, how to deal with this open criminal felony crime that officials put against people. Let me read now. This is a case of Al Haiti versus Cable with a K. And I'll read through and let's see if I can get through this. Very important. I'm going to have to read some of it because I want to set it up. It's very important to have the setup and then I'm going to jump. It's, not, it's important to not disregard what the government does as an excuse, but it's not important for my purposes here. Actually, how the, res- how the government responds to try and negate your fundamental rights that they know is supposed to be protected is very important to read because it, it, it gives you, anticipates what they're going to say when if this ever comes up for you. Again, not particular to the watch list. This will be the same answer because it's actually, the subject matter is actually national security. When they bring out a police power imperative, like they're keeping care of the community, this will address all that stuff when you understand what the judge is saying relative to the constraints once it moves into there. And that once it moves into there, you'll hear, I mean, hopefully you'll hear what I've been telling you also in this case. You aren't constrained yourself to the administrative. You can jump out and do the judicial. And as I say, you move the equity forward. You move, the, because there's no adequate remedy at law in that case, you move an equity action forward. And you're basically vilifying the system because they haven't provided it. And that's the whole purpose behind this thing is that they have not provided the actual due process. You'll hear due process. They say basically what due process is is what I've told you. It's opportunity, notice of the thing, notice of it, the meaningful notice, meaningful opportunity to respond. That's it. That's all. You, that's what it is. It's basic requirements. There is no other requirements, folks. And then those can be conditioned. And if you don't know that, you don't know how to how to make the record that they didn't have the right to condition them at all. And I, I mean, my mind starts to go nuts here a little bit. What have I been thinking about about this? This will also bring up the Hague case, the producer case, the public lands case, the public domain case, the Hague family, and uh, who got vilified for decades. When I, and I was shocked to hear he didn't understand about appurtenant rights. You'll hear about liberty-related interests. That's the appurtenant rights to the original right or property. This case will identify these things I've been telling you and partly why I want to kind of read it to you. So if you don't listen to me or can't hear it from me, this case kind of, it doesn't, it's not the end all case, but it explains it. So here we go. And it's just a memorandum opinion and order because, and I think I have to read this and I don't know where, I couldn't find a readable content, a, a searchable content file and only the first page is searchable to go through and give you the highlights. Uh, so it makes it a little bit more difficult. But this is just a memorandum of opinion because the plaintiff, who were the 23 people who found harm, co- constitutional harms could be done with the way they do this, made a summary a motion for summary judgment. The government made a summary judgment for, uh, summary a motion for uh, a motion for summary judgment to end the case, dismiss the case. And those two summary judgments go together before the judge, and the judge has a standard by which they deal with that. And when the dust cleared, the people suing the government for having constitutional violations in the in the lack of procedures to put them on the on the list uh, prevailed. Now, how they get how the judge gets there brings up some very important points. Uh, So, memorandum and opinion and order. So the this is a summary decision. There's no court case. They didn't determine, and you'll hear it. I mean, if I get the, can get there, as far as the point in the statement, they don't say that the watch lists or the no-fly lists are, are unconstitutional. They actually say the government interest in national security is compelling. 
And I've told you, you need to attack that. I've told you a couple things. And one of the things that came to occur to me, so I get it out of the, my, my mind here, it, given that the law require, uh, set, does not provide provision for United States citizens, uh, citizens or United States person is what they talk to. I told you, watch out for that one as well. Does not actually pertain to that, then this whole thing can be attacked. And now I'm back to your presumption of innocence. Where did that go? And you'll hear inside that the presumption of innocence has a power, but they don't say it that way. So I'm going to start reading Memorandum and Opinion and Order. Plaintiffs are 23 United States citizens. And in some regard, folks, I want you to think about this. this could, there's 4,000, so it's 600 Americans in this list. Yeah, not a, it's a drop in the bucket, but it's like a, we're not supposed to convict one innocent man or woman, are we? But here we have 4,600 that are, their lives are essentially destroyed. I know by the ruling here, the chairman of the mining district is on this list because of something that he signed that we did to try and stop a crime against the Secretary of Interior and how he's been treated since at the airports. He, and he fits this description of no longer flying and has to drive because of his mistreatment now. And so this case, I just sent this case and some other cases to him. I said, here, here's what we've been looking for to delineate the problem. And this is a case that says that when they finally come to the answer, because they don't have an answer to this case, the judge has asked for more. What are you going to do? Between you two parties, how are you going to reconcile this? And the government's got their say, and the, say, the plaintiffs have their say, is that you're going to be able to inquire whether or not you're on the list in order to deal with it. Point is... You have to do that. You're not free of not doing that. Why, I tell you, you have to address things in certain ways. So plaintiffs are 23 United States citizens who claim that because of their inclusion in the federal government's terrorist screening database, or TSDB, the terrorist screening database, referred to colloquially as the watch list, they have suffered a range of adverse consequences without a constitutionally adequate remedy. Interjection. There's your equity statement. This is not in law. So keep track of all this, folks. It's very important to be able to do so. And for, the, for those of you that say this is too complicated, stop making the excuse. You're just being mind weak. You're just, it's a, a wrong excuse. Yeah, they've made it this way, but this was up to us to keep together. Don't, don't go mentally weak on yourself. I mean, don't insult yourself like that. If you can't, that's why I say get the document, start reading, read it line by line until you kind of get how to, how this thing works, what they're saying, what word you're going to have in your mouth when the, someone comes after you. I think everybody has to leave their house somewhere. There's all kinds of happenstance that could go on that you may have to have to say something, have some response, or not. Know when to not. Know when to hold them and when to fold them. Right, Vinny. You're good at all that song stuff. I'm not. I just listen to this, and those songs come in my mind relative to what I'm reading, and these are truisms in the world, and we don't take a, even pay attention to that, even though we want to be entertained by all that. Referred to as the watch list, without a constitutionally adequate remedy. There's your equity statement going on here. In Muhammad versus Holder, the court concluded the Department of Homeland Security Traveler Redress Inquiry Program, DHS TRIP, as that process existed at the time, did not provide, this is a 2015 case, folks, if you thought that, that I didn't uh, tell you how this has been working down, that there was still ability to, to protect yourself. And it's there to step on as a foundation. I don't know of anybody that has. But here it is. I mean, they're just, this court case tells us that there's foundations to be working with to stop this nonsense since 9-11. As the process existed at the time, at the time, did not provide a constitutionally adequate remedy for the United States citizen who had been listed on the no-fly list, which is a subset of persons included in the TSDB who are prohibited from boarding a commercial aircraft that traversed U.S. airspace and outlined that it considered to be what it considered to be relevant considerations in assessing whether the subsequently revised THS trip, DHS trip, excuse me, which the court concluded was not constitutionally deficient on its face, provided the constitutionally adequate remedy 
in its application to any particular case. So understand how they're parsing this through. You do have to read this and read this over a couple times, and you've got to keep track. But again, it is imperative to be able to read these cases. This case won't be your case. This will be the standards on how they're going through, how the occupier, how the judges, so-called, and I'm not addressing whether that, that, that judge actually has jurisdiction here. I don't really know, I, but I can tell by the statutes there's a big question whether this would hold up anyway as law. And so this also sits here, this United States citizen. There's a definition for that. We talked about the pass, passport, the, the definitions that are in there. Maybe you're not. And so you would bring a case maybe slightly different. And this is where I say the presumption of innocence means you have no status at all. And they don't have the right to put it on you to put you in the process. If they don't have the right to put you in the process, they have no subject matter or personum jurisdiction, don't they? So we would tell them what they, how they can treat us if we tell them the wrong thing. You don't understand the dialogue here. You're, and this can apply anywhere, whether it's a traffic citation and license, whether this is a permit, or a trade occupation, a profession license, as you see in the States, for permission to do a privileged activity. It addresses all of that. So, I'm, excuse me, I'm interjecting. It's important to understand all this as I read this, uh, and it's going to be hard, but I'm going to continue to try to read straight through. The court concluded that it was not constitutionally deficient, this new revised DHS trip, but, but did it provide constitutionally adequate remedy in its application in any particular case? There's your special case designation, if you can be one. An individual's listing in the TASDB, in other words, there's an individual here, and that's got a definition as well, and I'm not going to, I'm just telling you to take note, whether or not the court is actually absolutely accurate on its application of these terms is something you have to consider. I put importance on them, but because I work on the aspect of what? I want to consider the worst case scenario than the least case. I just don't want to be any of this if I can be it, not be any of it, and I want to protect against this given that this is how they discuss who is subject and the constraint. So an individual's listing in the TD, TSDB without more does not prevent them from boarding flights, but that listing is disseminated to and used by federal, state, and foreign government agencies and officials to support various diplomatic and security functions and does trigger a variety of other consequences, including restrictions on the individual's ability to travel. Look where it goes, this stuff, folks, around the world, if you didn't think this was already global. And it does interfere with your ability to travel. You don't have the right of travel. You have, the, you have to have the ability. In this action, the court now considered, let me get back to the term. Yeah, this is an action. It's an equity action. It's all actions in the federal court. They're all equity. So he says the right word. He doesn't say case there. Hey, here you go. The court now considers whether THS TRIP, as it currently applies to a listing in the TSDB, provides to these United States citizen plaintiffs a constitutionally adequate opportunity to challenge their presumed inclusion in the TSDB. These are serious things you have to understand. Remember, we talk about you live in the world of presumption, and it's against you. He says it, this judge says it right here. Anyway, uh, going on. As the court acknowledged in the Muhammad, and there's a court case citation, I think it was the 200, 20, uh, 2015 case, this constitutional inquiry presents unsettled issues whose resolution is complicated by the criteria used to compile the TSDB and, quote, the classified information that, of necessity, is used to determine whether a person satisfies that criteria. Powerful statements in their application. Necessity, very difficult to destroy, when the, certainly when the government sets it up. And so this is how they're hiding this whole thing. But it does set up an inquiry that presents unsettled issues. Let me remind you of the Nick case. They said when you have a takings issue up front, the takings itself is the constitutional harm, which does cause, the. we'll use the word now, standing. You'll hear that later. That does cause immediate standing. It eliminates the administrative side. So keep track of this. I said it a little early, but keep track of that. 
they're talking administrative here, and they're using necessity against you. Uh, going on, presently pending are the parties' cross motions for summary judgment as to the plaintiff's remaining claims. Count one of the amended complaint, a Fifth Amendment procedural due process claim, and count three, an Administrative Procedure Act APA claim. Underlying both of these claims is the plaintiff's contention that they were denied a meaningful opportunity to challenge their presumed placement on the TSDB. Now, let me go stop here. How many times I've told you you have to attack the through the administrative procedures on your takings issue? And there's some other things that they're not even talking about here. Uh, again, the attorneys in this case re-brought up old claims that were defeated prior. Again, uh, set up for the takedown, they found two more. It was the administrative procedures claim I told you to go through and this takings issue. And there's going to be others, but I'm not going to talk about them because they're not in this case. So this confirms what I've been telling you and what I've told you about no, a due process, the meaningful opportunity to challenge their presumed placement means you're under it as a presumption. You're not free, folks. Uh, okay, now moving back into discussion. What, is the, what does it say here? Specifically, plaintiffs claim that they were not provided notice of their placement on the watch list. A meaningful opportunity to refute any derogatory information that was used to place them on the watch list and that as a result of these constitutional violations, they have been denied their liberty interests in, one, international travel, two, listen folks, two, interstate travel, and three, being free from false governmental stigmatization as a terrorist. Uh, interjection, isn't that your, what I've been telling you, defamation charge? You have a right to be free from uh, being a criminal. You have the right to remain innocent. You have the right of the presumption of innocence. Your presumption now goes up against the states and government's presumption, doesn't it? This this case, they asserted that being free from false governmental stigmatization, stigmatization as a terrorist. This is critical to see right here. This is what I've been telling you. These three points are what I, not the international travel that would have been the right to travel, the the ability to go through, the ability, and then the interstate for us within the domestic uh, realms. I've told you I've got no plans to go anywhere uh, to do this, but I'll tell you what, I don't plan to because, as this case will point out, I do not want to subject myself to this kind of terroristic tactics under the color of terrorism, underneath the color of national security. And... So I have to weigh the, the benefits of what, it, what I do elsewhere, what I need to do elsewhere, versus just sitting tight and doing this. And that statement I just made, when I, have, when I look at this and do not want to go through this nonsense, and, uh, and I'm averting travel, that is standing right up front. And so you listen for that. Uh, if I have to go and become presumed to be a terrorist to go travel and become underneath a data acquisition systems, I won't do it in the first instance. That keeps me from going out. That is a constitutional violation. And then they're going to weigh up against that national security necessity, and I'm going to have to attack that. Uh, but anyway, going back to this now. Understand what they're talking about. The court is going through a discussion here, claiming, telling you what they, what the plaintiffs were saying was their harm, and by how. So you now you also hear how you bring your claim. It's not just I've been hurt. There's a thing that happened that caused a fundamental uh, harm, a harm to a fundamental right or property that, that has no excuse me, adequate remedy at law. Defendants, here reading, contend, now the defendants is the government. The plaintiffs cannot establish with sufficient certainty an impending future injury sufficient to support standing. The further, they further contend that even if plaintiffs can establish standing, they're Claimed injuries resulting from the placement of the TSDB do not constitute a deprivation of any liberty interest protected by the Due Process Clause, and that in any event, DHS TRIP, the review process which an individual may request a review of their presumed placement of the TSDB, is constitutionally adequate to protect any limited liberty interest plaintiffs may have, particularly given the government's interest in combating terrorism. There's the boogeyman. But you see the even if statements. They, they stack three of them. 
And so you give yourself a stack of three. This is what I tell you to do. This is what I just, you just show you the government's doing right here. I say do that for yourself. Even if the government was right, this is how it fails. Even if the government could present a, a terrorism a need, here's how it fails. Let me, get, let me follow up on that one. Uh, the government says terrorism, but the law says it's not supposed to apply to United States persons unless they have what? Probable cause. So an investigative process is not adequately protecting you, and it puts you into the process of presumption, which is not adequately protecting you against your own presumption that the government shall not step on, which is the presumption of innocence at every time, until what? Probable cause, not implication. And I'm speaking to you people on the street now. Domestically, your interstate travel is affected by these watch lists. Your interstate travel is affected by an investigative action of the government. Here's the clues that lead you into the streets that show you how to argue against the cop in the streets if you're putting this together. Going on, for the reason stated herein, plaintiff's motion for summary judgment is granted. Now, let me stop. i got to stop. Remember what the government just put up a stack of three things. Even if they had this right, they don't have the right. We have the power. The guard comes right back in the next paragraph and says, no, the plaintiff's, the government's position is uh, not supportable. Despite what the government says, it's not supportable. Plaintiffs are uh, summary judgments granted. This is powerful. So you got to see how. And again, don't go in the dicta. That's the principles. Work the principles, and that's how they came to the point. Does that mean you get it? No. You have your own case. Then you're going to have to develop it the way I've been suggesting to you to develop it and or have a word in your mouth this way that you're developing it real time in front of a, uh, a soldier of the occupation. Going on, briefly, briefly summarize, the court concludes, and so you take this away, take your notes. One, plaintiffs have established that they have standing to raise their constitutional challenges. challenges. Two, plaintiffs have constitutionally protected liberty interests that are implicated by their inclusion in the TSDB. And three, the DHS trip process through which plaintiffs may challenge their inclusion is in the TSDB is not constitutionally adequate to protect those liberty interests. Now, let's go back to the origination of all those other st stories without losing the point here. Does that say those lists are not constitutional? I hope you just said no. All they're saying is that the presumption against you should have a remedy that isn't fulfilled by the administrative process. This does not even argue as I would. It's not even applicable. Unless you can show some due process, the probable cause. In other words, the, the meaningful process before for the establishment of probable cause where the statutes don't pertain even to a U.S. citizen. Okay, going on to read here. Background. I'm just talking to you guys making notes, you gals making notes. To go back and hash this through what I've been saying when you read this case. These are just my thoughts as I come off this. There's more and much more to say. Uh, and I'm not going to get there uh, reading like this speed, so I'm going to have to pick it up. Uh, background. Well, this is important, too. How much can I read? I'm going to run out of time, I think. Uh, this is a 32-page document, and I'm discussing it. Uh, uh, background. Let me read this thing, and I'm going to have to probably jump. I know i got to get to page 16 quick. Because that's where all the big, cool, juicy stuff is. But the setup is so important. Some of the setup, I've explained what they're setting up and how you have to interpret it in order to how you're going to apply what they say later on and how uh, it applies to you or doesn't and how you have to con conform your statement to this thing. But here's some of the background. Unless otherwise noted, the following facts are undisputed. Again, if you read all this, this disputation process was in the due process of the cases. Cases a couple of years old, many years old, and lots of filings went on for all this. So understand that this just didn't happen overnight, uh, but there was a, a give and take in all how the, uh, the rules of evidence were applied, and the following facts are undisputed. And this is the point of a summary judgment. If there's no facts, if all the facts are undisputed, and those facts amount to a, fulfill the claim of the party making the uh, filing the lawsuit, that's summary judgment. If there's any outstanding facts that could turn on the outcome of the case, it doesn't get this. It doesn't get dismissed here. So this is important too to understand. Uh, A. The TSDB, the Terrorism Screening Center, the TSC, is an interagency operation within the Federal Bureau of Investigation that also involves the Department of Homeland Security, 
DHS, the National Counterterrorism Center, NCTC, and the Transportation Security Administration, TSA, and the United States Customs and Border Protection. A uh, pause here, folks. Does that mind blow you? And the FBI is the, like, like top one, and they're the ones that says so-called sovereign citizens, which is an oxymoron nonetheless. They, they determine what a, a sovereign citizen is, and you don't think you're on that list if they've determined it just by a statement? They say it right on the website. Is this inside a system of constraint, or is this outside in the Department of Justice doing justice? This judge exposes for you who all the players are that are doing all, that all agree to an unconstitutional process, to a presumption that's also applicable to you, and never said anything about whether that was right. It can't mean also that the Congress meant any help to you as well. It's ongoing on. Statement of the material facts. Of the material facts. Referencing documents, the TSDB is a centralized collection of information about listed individuals, including biographic and biometric data that is compiled and maintained by the TSC. The information contained in the TSDB, which is unclassified, is, quote, updated continuously and disseminated around the country and world in real time, close quote. You don't think you live in a globalized, controlled world? There's your statement. They did it through 9-11, folks. It was perfect. They executed it perfectly, and they're, they're still executing people, uh, the, the, the plan, and pretty soon they'll be executing people. Statement of Material Facts 12. As of June 2017, approximately 1.2 million individuals, including approximately 4,600 United States citizens, or lawful permanent residents. And there's maybe the definition that of what a United States citizen is underneath this law, folks. The or doesn't say either. It says or. That's conjunctive under federal standards. Under what? No, so that United States citizen and lawful permanent residence is the status. And so, anyway, that's up for you to discern a little bit closer. Why I say be careful on these statu on these determinations, but the, including 4,600 United States citizens, I'll guarantee you that it doesn't matter just a United States citizen. Forget whether or not the question comes up about their lawful permanent residence relative to the naturalization laws, which people that are born here shouldn't be under, correct? I mean, this is how they pull that out. What, Title VIII, I think, is that under the United States Code? Uh, where included, or all these are included in that uh, TSDB. An individual may be nominated to the TSDB by a federal government agency or foreign government. Now, for those of us that, uh, well, I just had to correct myself. I was going to say, for those of us inside the United States of America, we, foreign government should be the least of our worries. But then we find that Twitter is a cause of action, isn't it? Foreign government don't like what you're saying. All of a sudden, you get put on this list, don't you? And so... Again, we're all tied up in the system uh, around the world. Here, you're nominated. I get nominated. You're going to be voted. You don't even get. No one votes for you, folks. You just get nominated and you win. How's that? Fact 16: Nominated individuals are added to the TSDB in their nomination is and their no, if their nomination is based quote upon articulable intelligence of inf or information which, based on the totality of the circumstances and taken together with the rational inferences from those facts, creates a reasonable suspicion that the individual is engaged or has been engaged or intends to engage in conduct constituting in preparation for or in aid in, or in furtherance of or related to terrorism and or terrorist activities. That's a quote. That's out of the law, most likely, and I'm going to put those ors back together. It doesn't say either. Those or just say you're going to eventually cut out everything they say and get to the last the last comma in preparation for you can cut out everything you saw there and just go to terrorism or terrorist activities and you will have qualified that whole sentence. In other words, each one of those statements is a part of the last thing as a definition. This is not a list of individual things. This is all talking about terrorism or terroristic activities. And if you're not a terrorist, or you're presumed innocent from that, notwithstanding the 911. Uh, laws, uh, the engagement there, uh, then this is only relating to terrorism, actual foundable findable terrorism. But they don't need probable cause, they just need suspicion, rational inferences. And so this is, you have to understand all these standards that the not, this is administration is using, not judicial. Uh, all nominations 
to the TSDB are reviewed by the TSC. There's a review process internal, which in assessing whether an individual should be placed in the TSDB must determine whether the United States government has a, quote, reasonable suspicion that the individual is known a or suspected terrorist. A known suspected, a known terrorist is, identif- is defined as, quote, an individual who has been, one, arrested, charged by information, or indicted for, or convicted of a crime related to terrorism and or terrorist activities by the United States government or foreign government authorities. Let me interfere and interject here. The charge by information, that's before conviction. So there just has to be a an information. And they said that already there's administrative information that are rationally infer, inferred by the facts. So be careful on what you think is they're actually saying and maybe don't narrow it down there. But the United States government does this. But you also know that the United States government might be every state agency, isn't it? Who are under obligations to talk about this. Or, going on to, identified as a terrorist or a member of a terrorist organization pursuant to statute, executive order, or international legal obligation pursuant to the United Nations Security Council resolution. Let me interject again on that. And uh, that is where I was telling you before, this has to do with terrorists or members of organizations. And they've extended it to everybody. And this was improper. They don't have a right to engage you. It's like what I say about the tax, uh, to the tax code. But until the commissioner finds your activity, so-called, a quote, activity, uh, is a, is a liable to tax, and that the person run the person therefore is liable to tax. They, they have to give you then due process to determine uh, and find all these things with you in a meeting. That's the, the example of how this was actually should actually work actually in, a, in in large respect relative to your presumption of innocence, not your presumption as a suspect terrorist. But anyway, they define suspect terrorist here as an individual, quote, individual who is reasonably suspected to be engaging in, has engaged in, or intends to engage in conduct constituting in preparation for, in aid of, or relating to terrorism or terrorist activities. Again, to understand that a terror suspected terrorist is an individual who is reasonably suspected of engaging in terrorism and terrorist activities. Past, present, future, whatever, in your dreams, whatever. Now, is that any of you? And if it's not any of you, why are you subject to this presumption? Is my what I would say my first my first step of coming out of the gate with these people. Anyway, number fourteen here, in uh, determining whether the uh, to accept, reject, or modify a nomination, the TSC may consider, but may not solely base its decision on an individual's race, ethnicity, religious affiliation, or quote beliefs and activities protected by the First Amendment, such as freedom of speech freedom exercise of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of peaceable assembly, and the freedom to petition the government for redress of uh, redress of stress of grievance, grievances. Uh, interesting. That's a quote. Uh, so you see that's the First Amendment and just restated. And I wondered there, what, is that the only one? What about the rest of the amendments there? But at any rate, if you say something out of turn on social media, then uh, they really can't put you on this list. But there's no check and balance we find out about that. So going on, the TS the TSC may also consider an individual's travel history, associates, business associations, international associations, financial transactions, and study of the Arabic of Arabic as information supporting a nomination to the TSDB. Interjection. Well, that must mean you must be interested to speak in, uh, with Arabic people and do business with them. It has nothing to do with people in the United States that are not doing much of anything else and not uh, focusing on what they're focusing on here is the is the Muslims or Islam or Arabs or maybe even Persians and all that stuff. So the, again, this this is this doesn't because I think all the plaintiffs here uh, were of this class of people. That's why they're mentioning it. But what if you're not? This shouldn't even be here, and it shouldn't be applied to you, is what I've been telling you to argue, or set up as the facts, which are fundamentally violated because of the process at all, because they don't apply the law faithfully. Going on to read here, an individual's placement into the TSDB does not require and any evidence that the person engaged in criminal activity committed a crime or will commit a crime in the future, and the individuals who have been acquitted of terrorist-related can, crime may still be listed at the TSDB. And so now this is a very important problem. You see that they can just the the barest peep that that you might be involved. 
Does it matter? There's no thing here that you can be involved with once they put you on. It does not require evidence that you've been engaged in any criminal activity. That's an attack on your presumption of innocence. And so you're going to find as we read through this, as I'm, again, I'm only two, two more, three more pages since the last time, how they go, uh, how he, this judge sets this up, and you're reading through to find out what the listing of the things are, how people are being harmed. I'm asking you to think about how you're being harmed may be different and maybe not even within this case, that makes your case more powerful. Let me get into the partners because it ties into the prior t tabs and why I put those together as well when I saw this. The TSCSC shares TSDB with various, quote, partners, including federal, state, and foreign government, official, uh, government agencies and officials. And it goes on. What did we talk about before? What was in the other lists? Here they are right here. And who then, the government agencies officials, who then use that information to support their screening, vetting, credentialing, diplomatic, military, intelligence, law enforcement, visa, immigration, and other security functions. These partners include CP, CBP. Does that have anything to do with people in the United States? Well, no, but that's what they're applying it to. Everyone, which screens all, all individual travelers against the TSDB when they seek to enter the United States. You see that they take you as a citizen coming back, so-called, and they screen you like you're an, uh, an individual travel that's subject. That's that's incorrect. The Coast Guard gets some, which along with the CBP uh, uses the TSDB to screen passengers and crew manifests for ships traveling through the United States waters and seaports. TSA, which uh, screens air travelers against TSDB and to designate anyone as a list on the list as high risk status, subjecting them to additional pre-boarding security screening. That is found in this case to be a harm in its own as well because you weren't, shouldn't have been subject if you weren't subject, right? But they do this administratively without, it's a presumption that you cannot refute. Again, it's not that the list is unconstitutional. It's that the process to try to stay off of it isn't, isn't uh, adequate. The State Department also gets this information. You're talking about the passport being the most important travel document we talked about in the last few the last case, uh, broadcast or not, the State Department gets this list for the THD, TSDB to screen individuals for visa waiver, uh, visa waiver, visa and passport eligibility. So if you say you're a United States citizen or a United States person, you're subject to this uh, this in, this uh, scrutiny, aren't you? If you're not a subject class, then you can make the case that you're not, aren't you? Right there, United States citizenship in caps and immigration services, USCIS which checks the TSDB status of individuals who apply for, uh, for or many benefit from immigration, asylum, and naturalization benefits. Well, all of you all seem to be under Title VIII, so that's the immigration and naturalization law. Why? Why are you there, folks? Unless the United States is this foreign nation and you're uh, around going around its territory as, as residents. Uh, going on. Hey, DHS gets it, which is in conjunction with other agencies using the TSDB screen, TSA, TS. TCE, uh, TSC, uh, CPB, and employers and contractors also get it. Private sector employees with the transportation and infrastructure function get it. Individuals with any form of uh, or former air airport identification and those applying for or maintaining transportation worker identification credentials. Federal Aviation Administration Airman Certificate, all you pilots. And hazardous material transportation licenses, all you truckers. If you didn't think transportation was a big deal when they were talking about how the terrorists were going to take us down as a nation. And no one said, well, wait a minute, that was your fault. You derelict in your duty to protect us. Now why are you using your dereliction to, har to har harm us? Going on, the Department of Defense, DOD, well, didn't you just hear DARPA is going to get involved with Google to come after you for so-called elections and other things, make you, the like White House is coming after for your mental hold? You want to get you want to get all this information going backwards to come and come back to this list. This is you're watching. This case explains how you're already captured essentially, and yet there's this little silver line, the narrow path. The FBI, which administer also administers this uh, TSCI, also uses the TSDB to conduct and facilitate law enforcement screening and investigations, and for the purpose of shares TSDB information with more than eighteen thousand state, local, county, city university and college, tribal and federal law enforcement agencies and approximately 533 private entities through the National Crime Information Center system. 
system, folks, system, which these law enforcement agencies and private entities then use this to screen individuals they encounter in traffic stops, field interviews, house visits, and municipal permit processes. Are you infiltrated, folks? Are you surrounded like I've been telling you? This court case just kind of lays this all out on who's doing it. And it's supposed to be the Department of Justice is just a, now can presume upon you that you're, you're subject. So they're saying that all these people get the, in this case, all these, people, all these organizations of people, private entities, are getting all your information. You never get this information. And all those people can report in, and it goes back through again. When did they come to ask you about it, folks? When did you have a say in this? Did you even have a concept of how this all worked? TSDB data is also shared with more than 60 foreign governments with the, which the TSC has entered into foreign partnership arrangements which, subject to their domestic laws and restrictions in the agreements, use the information for terrorist screening purposes. Let's get to the United States, to, subject to their domestic laws. If that was the case, why is this case even on the books? If they were subject to domestic laws in the first place, the our government wouldn't have been arguing that they had the right to do this to people. So that, they, although that's a quote in the statement, this is how quickly you can find out, no, none of these entities and none of these private people are following any law, and they don't care to. And the presumption is against you, so they don't have a care. And you stay as crickets about it. Individuals who are included in the TSDB and who are misidentified as or near matches to TSD listees may experience, quote, delay, inconvenience, or other difficulties at the point of screening where TSDB data is used for screen terrorists, quote, uh, close quote, including being denied boarding on international flights, being subject to secondary inspection, having their electronic devices and those of their traveler companions subject to advanced search, and if they are a foreign national, being denied admission to the United States. Individuals who experience travel-related difficulties that they attribute to their wrongful inclusion in the TSDB may seek redress by submitting a traveler inquiry form to DSC, DHS TRIP, Defendant Statement Material Facts, the submission triggers a review by the DHS trip of the information submitted by the travel, which in 98% of the cases results in a determination that the claim traveled difficulties had no connection to an individual's inclusion in the TSDB. The interjection. How is that 98% not, inconsist uh, not inconsistent uh, with the local prosecution rate of everybody that goes through any local bar association DA uh, or judge? Uh, going on. In cases where the individual is a match to the identity in the T TSDB, okay, an individual has to match up. How are they doing that? Who's giving the information to allow the matching is the so-called individual. That's you. And so I've always said you, you challenge whether or not they got you right. It was just on some s suspicion that you don't have any information on an identity. If you don't have to give it to them, uh, now, be careful on this when you get on the street because you're supposed to identify something. Uh, but if you can give them a name, and that should be sufficient, not a status. You should be commanding the conversation now over to identify it's no no probable cause. This is an investigative report now, uh, stop now. Now he has to provide because he's interfering with fund or she is interfering with fundamental rights, as you'll read in this case. Uh, with uh, now has to establish how they're providing the due process required to protect you. When they go from from probable cause failure, they go into administrative side, investigative stuff. You have, can still this case allows you to understand where they're uh, where they're what they're supposed to provide. I guess is the important part here for us domestically, notwithstanding how they treat us. Okay, so let me move on here. Let me get up uh, now. So when you hear who's involved, all these same the academia caught me because that picked up on the other case where all this information that they do, all this screening, all this data they're collecting goes through the university system. Why? Well, not only is it for the so-called learning, I mean, this is getting in and money and all that. But see, that's the consensus process hubs come out of the academia. All the stuff that's defeating us that I talk about for production and uh, public domain, it's all coming out of academia. All the universities, they all know who you is. They're all told about this. And, and so let me get, I'm going to move around in time. Let me get up to the most important points here. There's a lot more to read. You'll learn how people are damaged. You'll learn how, it go, how that goes on, how to say that's what's happened to me, and this harm, was there was no protection for it. I was innocent, uh, uh, notwithstanding the presumption, and my rights were violated. 
Now, this case is going to probably bring on procedures. Those may not even be accurate. The point is, is if you find out you can tell them that it's not supposed to apply, it doesn't matter what they've done, that it's all wrong, and your harm has happened in the first instance, like the Nick case told us just well, weeks ago. Let me move up quickly. A lot to read. I didn't, didn't think I was going to make it through, but it really didn't get close. Uh, let's go to page 16 for those of you who make taking notes and rolling through. You really have to read the rest of it. See how how the people are violated. See what the court is identifying. This is all the court identifying how this works. Now the court gets more into conclusory statements about what they've set up. And we get to page 16 and it starts to get really important to understand and read. And so I'll start here and read through and hopefully we'll get through it uh, in time. No fly list. Now remember this is different than the TSDB. No fly list. Defendants, defendant, the government concede. Look, listen very clearly on what is being acknowledged that they will concede, but they don't give you credit for it. Find the, well, even if that was the case, we're not going to, we can do it otherwise. you got to take note of what this is. And I will say, as I was reading through it, this in slightly different words, these concessions are what the, uh, like a cop will impose upon you locally in the same manner that they don't have a right to actually impose. You can listen to it but they don't have a right to impose it. So I say you better have a way to step sidestep that and put the more uh, uh, more substantial law and requirements on them. Defendants, the government concedes that there is uncontradicted testimony that at least five of the plaintiffs in this action, give their names, are regularly subjected to enhanced screening that they attribute to their inclusion in the, in the TSDB. Plaintiffs have adequately... Okay, here's the point about this, folks. They couldn't know that they were on the list. They have. This is what I tell you to do. You find out the elements that constitute the consideration, the probable cause you believe that you would be on that list because of how you're treated. You're only treated because you would be on that list. Otherwise, you wouldn't be treated that way to cause the presumption to flip that it you are on the list even if the government doesn't want to present it. And this is a critical, that little paragraph was a critical insight that the plaintiffs had to do that. They had to construct elements of harm, tie it to some other objective basis. Then they could imply that it was effective based on the fact that if it, I mean, the idea that if it's not, they wouldn't have, the law wouldn't require it, wouldn't allow it. And so this is an important element on how you do this. Going on, plaintiffs have adequately, listen carefully, folks, because of that, the uncontradicted testimony, in other words, affidavits or depositions of five plaintiffs that they had subjected to enhanced screening, plaintiffs have adequately established with sufficient certainty impending future injury that is, quote, actual, concrete, and particularized and traceable to the defendants. That quote is right out of the law what you have to do. It's not just your opinion. You have to establish accurate, concrete, particularized things that are traceable to the actor that's doing you harm. If you don't, you lose. Here's a list on how you do, what you need to do, and that the plaintiffs in this case did it. You get to go read for that. Uh, those who administer the TSDB and in, uh, use it in determining whether an individual is detained for additional screening. In that regard, because of the enhanced screening and other travel-related difficulties they have encountered, multiple plaintiffs have refrained from exercising their movement-based rights including their right to international travel. Remind you here, they also talked about domestic travel. I think we're going to get to that, but don't forget that's also included in your treatment underneath all these cops getting all this information to red flag anybody they want. They do this even without this list either. This is my problem with uh, with this is that you know it's happening otherwise that you can use to go step back, step these, these conditions in when you're making your record at the point of first contact. Uh, as the court recognized in Muhammad, uh, 2017 case, these plaintiffs, for all of you that want to vilify, I don't know if anybody in my listenership will or do, uh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe you do, uh, the, you would vilify like Muslims or uh, Islam or whatever, understand the that they were the low-hanging fruit, you're next. And so you should give a credit to the people that have suffered and were willing and able to come forward to make this case, at least this case, that you can now reference to what's coming your way. But if they hadn't done this, for whatever their reasons, or for whatever vilification you might place, they hadn't been treated like this, they wouldn't have brought this out, and you wouldn't have been known you're next. And anyway, as the court recognized in Muhammad 2017, 
the plaintiffs, quote, decision to not engage in international travel because of the difficulties they reasonably expect to encounter upon return to the United States is sufficient to demonstrate standing. Remember the Nick case. The harm is immediate. You don't have to go through any administration. Defendants argue that the plaintiffs, do I want to read this? Okay, they went to the ripeness. The ra basic rationale in the defendant, the government's objection to this position was the ripeness doctrine to prevent the courts through avoidance of the premature adjudication from entangling themselves in abstract disagreements. The court assesses ripeness by, quote, here's a test, here's your thing, you've got to balance here, folks, the test, what the court's going to do when you bring your case, or this will the court, the, the record you make with a point of first contact with a cop or a code enforcement officer or whatever, you need to establish these things. This is what I'm talking to in the investigative reporter part when you have a different word in your mouth. You have a different question. It's not just that I'm free to go. You establish that they don't have the right to continue, that you've stepped into a fundamental position that's protectable immediately, not subject to the investigative interview. But the court assesses ripeness, the ability to go to judiciary, in this case, the ripeness by, quote, balancing the fitness of the issues of the judicial decision with the hardship of the parties of withholding court consideration. A, court, a case is not ripe when, quote, the problems such as the inadequacy of record or ambiguity in the record will make the cause unfit for adjudication on the merits. Interjection again. How many times have I told you? You make the record, make it adequate, make it direct, certain, in this case, don't make it an ambiguity. And I'm talking your first point of contact, not dealing with an agency administratively. I'm talking about your investigative stops. That's what I'm talking about, your point of first contact. What you're doing is that statement that the court just did, and he makes reference to other court cases. So I'm, I'm telling you that this court uh, decision supports what I've been telling you is what you need to do and to put it in your head and your mind ahead of time, how we actually should be thinking as a society. Court goes on here, and Muhammad, uh, then they cite this, uh, so the court concluded that the plaintiff's challenge to his inclusion in the no-fly list was ripe despite his failure to exhaust DHS trip, uh, trip's administrative requirements because, quote, there is nothing hypothetical about plaintiff's claims which attack the constitutionality of the fly, no-fly list. Close quote. Folks, what have I been saying? Attack the constitutionally straight up. Don't, don't put up with the administrative intrusion. That's the Nick case again. Uh, I mean, I'm just talking since I've been telling you this for decade and, and writing about it before. But the court further observed that the, this is a different case that this judge is relying on. And actually, I think this judge has been involved on these cases, so that's a continuum of discussion. Uh, the DHS trip process is already established, and plaintiff's participation in the process would not provide the court with more information about how the process works than the court already possesses or could be presented at trial. For substantially the same reasons, the claims brought by the plaintiff who have not exhausted their DHS trip remedies in this action are nevertheless ripe for adjudication. The plaintiff's claims are therefore justiciable. They get to go to judicial. They're not stuck in that exhaustive uh, uh, remedy, administrative remedy hold that they like to put everybody in. Well, how? Because your fundamental rights have been invol involved. It triggers it immediately. They did a, ta a Fifth Amendment, essentially, takings interference claim. The procedural due process claim. Whenever a person is deprived, quote, liberty or property interests within the meaning of the due process clause, close quote, procedural due process mandates, close quote, quote, constraints on governmental decisions, citing Matthew Eldridge versus Eldridge. The scope, uh, the strength and scope of those constraints vary, quote, as the particular situation demands, close quote. What have I said? Case by case basis is what they're saying there. Your particular situation articulated clearly and succinctly is how you move your case through, not on someone else's. And in other words, the strength and scope of these constraints vary if they don't have an authority that's only going to be declared by you. If you walk in in a case like this and you don't and you don't claim you're not subject to that, the court doesn't have to look at that. You get the rights you, you argue, or you present. Nevertheless, the court, there are quote basic requirements that procedural due process in each instance demands, including notice and meaningful opportunity to be heard. 
There's your definition of due process, exactly what I've told you. Notice an opportunity. Notice opportunity, and I add time in place. You have to have a time to do it in a place. In other words, the record has to show you were given that, and that's also part of the evidence. But the, what do they say here? You see the word including. Including means that's what it is. Nothing more, nothing less. Due process demands notice and meaningful opportunity to be heard. The word meaningful is serious. as a heart attack in this case that people overlook. This is a presumption against the government that requires the totality of the opportunity was dealt with. Not that, to, oh, I get to complain and refute, and then they get to, it falls on deaf ears, they round file it. No, a meaningful opportunity to be heard. Heard is a trier of fact, and it's supposed to be a neutral trier of fact. How do they do that inside, the de, inside a, um, an agency? And then how do they do it when you say, but I'm not supposed to be part of this whole thing anyway, is what I would like you to think about as you're thinking about what they're saying here. The Supreme Court outlined the ability, applicability analysis for procedural due process claims as follows: identification for specific for for the of identification of the specific dictates of due process generally requires consideration of three distinct factors: first, the private interest that will be affected by the official action; second, the risk of erroneous deprivation of such interest through a procedural procedures used, and the probable value, if any of additional or substitute procedural safeguards, and finally, the government's interest, including the function involved and the fiscal and administrative burdens that the additional and substitute procedural requirements would entail. Now, if you thought you had a free right, and you don't think the government's interest in every regard is not considered, take special cognizance of that last part. Fiscal and administrative burdens. Now, you've got to be very sharp to figure out where they're cutting corners too sharp, and that's what this case starts to become about. But you're still subject. I've been saying you need to set up your record, the status that you weren't supposed to be subject, not to even this. Then we're going to get a lot better. But anyway, the, Matthew calcul the Matthews case calculus contemplates a judicious balancing. If you don't understand consensus and the balancing of all this stuff, you don't understand the administrative life and living you're living under, and even the courts dealing with fundamental rights in an administrative balancing condition. You don't have them directly. Judicial balancing of these concerns through the analysis of the risk of erroneous deprivation of a private interest if the, if the process were reduced and the probable value, if any, of, of additional or st substitute procedural Safeguards For the purpose of the Matthews constitutional analysis, the court concludes, based on undisputed facts that the plaintiff's liberty interest implication by their inclusion in the TSDB, though weaker than those implicated by placement on the no-fly list, are nevertheless strong. Nevertheless strong. And I'll have to end right there, folks. You have these strengths. They're going to put it up against the government's going to put their interest. And though the government's terrorist threats are compelling and the system to stop that are compelling, this case shows you the narrow path I told you is still there to start to push back and protect yourself against presumptions and secrecy. And there's so much more here. I've just got to page 18. There's uh, many more, many more points about this this uh, discussion that uh, we can discuss the basic requirements was important for you to hear that I tell you about the due process. The court concludes administrative process used uh, to place a person at TSDB is inherent substantial risk of erroneous deprivation and additional procedures similar to the no-fly list would reduce risk on erroneous conclusions, tell you they're not going to take out the no-fly list as unconstitutional, but that the inclusion is a substantial risk of erroneous deprivation. Just what I've been telling you, if I'm an in presumed innocent, a United States citizen, uh, even, even so, in the United United States properly, I can't be presumed to be the terrorist subject to this organization. I, I've been by that, by in that, fa I've facially been violated. Thank you, Grimner, for what you do at reallibertymedia.com and everybody that simulcasts and uh, past casts and uh, links it around and passes the word, folks. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be with you next week. Tech diffs or nature will. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. 
from behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast. This is Hal Anthony. Till next time, Journey with Purpose. Feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop ass.